How are we on? Good. Welcome to the Better Than Not podcast. Sometimes we get it right, sometimes we don't. But when we at least do something, we know it's almost always better than not. Hi there, and welcome to Better Than Not, the podcast that aims to capture not only shifting perspective, but thought-provoking ideas and conversation. And based loosely on my series, A Changing Frame of Reference, which you can read on the Substack app, and I hope you will, as it might give you some insight into what this podcast is all about. I'm your host, Doug Gardham, and today I get to welcome back First time in video, <laughs> Jesse Bragg. Jesse, how are you? I'm doing great, Doug. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm so glad you're on today. Lots to talk about. This, is, uh, this will be my first time doing a video <laughs> podcast. Oh, that's cool. Jesse is a friend that I first got to know when we moved out to Abbotsford. He helped us find a place to live. He's a realtor in the Fraser Valley area of Southern British Columbia. But not only that, Jesse brought a lot to the table with regards to real estate, trending information, stuff like that, But which you kind of expect in that area. But Jesse also recognizes um, that often and most of the time, this is a very significant time in people's lives when they're buying real estate of a house. Um, it's a time when it's probably one of the biggest purchases we'll make in our lives. And it can happen when we're in a very vulnerable position, be it excitement, having gotten married, having a baby, family growing to on the other family side, shrinking. Yeah, a death, a yeah. sickness, loss of a job, having to find a new place to locate. And Jesse really brought up significance to that because I think real estate has become such, I was, it's funny, um, I'm doing this introduction, but I was driving out to Chilliwack the other day and I couldn't believe how many of the billboards were real estate billboards. Real estate, yeah. And never really recognized that before. But all of that, and in addition, just kind of brings a whole biblical perspective to how he works, which really mm -hmm. joined with my journey and what I'm going through, especially if you've pay attention to some of my writing in Substack or this podcast. So Jesse, have I missed anything? <laughs> I don't think so. It's uh, it's fantastic. <laughs> no, it's a great introduction. Thank you, Doug. I'm, I, uh, I'm never so perfect as I am uh, on your introduction. <laughs> no, so, I, I mean, I, th I think that it's uh, it's a very uh, gr great description of, of what, at least what I perceive I do. Um, I think, you know, real estate is definitely something that people people pursue from a financial perspective. That's their, their primary focus. Um, but really it's for me, uh, in addition to being, being a job, it's, it's allowed me a tremendous amount of satisfaction being able to, to have an impact in a meaningful way on people's lives, as opposed to just shuffling money from one big company to another big company and, and not really making it a difference. So right. that's, that's something that I, I appreciate about what I do. And I, and I was going to say, you, you exemplify that in, in the integrity of how you work. What I think is interesting is kind of how society and our media has brought it about mm -hmm. that it's really become that kind of entity. And we forget that it's a place where we live, right? Like mm -hmm. we, <laughs> we yep. have to live somewhere. <laughs> well, and I think, you know, one of the things I, that early came to my attention was the thought that, um, you know, the the scripture where it talks about God setting out the, the boundaries of our dwelling. Um, there is a, a verse that says, you know, unless the Lord builds the house, um, those that build it labor in vain. Mm. Um, you know, even um, in Isaiah 54, where it talks about stretching, in, enlarge your tent, stretch, yes. stretch your cords and length, strengthen your stakes, lengthen your cords. Um, you know, those are all house housing dwelling related things. And I, I think, you know, it came to me that God cares about where we live. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and that's an important thing. And so because it's important to God, it, it's, um, something that we can look to him for guidance and for care and concern, um, with, and so, um, I get to be that conduit some, you know, with some openly, uh, cause we could talk that way. And with others, um, I just get to be their, their guy on the inside, whether they realize it or not. So no, that to me, it's, it's very, 
you bringing that and it wasn't like you brought it to my attention it's just how you work like it's mm. it's not like um and i do this that wasn't kind of how it was it was just part sure. of like it just came out of you and that's really to me part of who you are it's interesting because it kind of brought me to the first thing that i've been <laughs> thinking about recently so we i don't know whether we've talked at all i know i've had a the podcast and other things um, with others but I've talked about the kind of the younger demographic today and um, driving less in the mm. sense that they don't go out. Like when I was growing up, um, I was like, you're kind of at the driver licensing office on your 16th birthday. Like that was the yeah. thing. It was in, a, in many ways, a car was an escape, a place to go. And today, I mean, I know the trendings are gone down, way down for getting licenses in, the, in your youth. And um, my question kind of, kind of goes to the real estate side is with the crazy stuff that's happened over the last five years, is the trending for younger first time buyers, like I know there's this thing that's like, well, we're just never gonna be able to buy a house. Um, but I can remember that back when we bought our first house as well. Like it was a challenge to put it all together. I'm not <laughs> saying that's comparable. I think that jump is just as big as it's, if not bigger than it's ever been. Yeah. But at the same time, my question is really, is the drive to get, because I can remember this being like forged by families almost, is you've got to get into a house, like you've got to get there. Mm. Is that still like that in, in that younger demographic, would you say? When you say get into a house, do you mean specifically a fully detached? No, I just mean home, buying, just a, re, a, buying a, real estate. A place, a place to live yes. that you own. Yes. Um, I think there's a couple of things at play. Number one, adolescence or, or adulthood is being delayed much later today than it ever has been. Um, I think that that kids staying at home till they're nearly thirty is um, is shortening up that that or is 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 adding to the fact that there's not as much of a, a focus on buying or at least buying as young as as what people used to. Right. Um, I think that the pain of paying rent. Uh, needs to be felt for people to start to think about, you know, the fact that that's just, I'm, I'm literally giving money. What Like I, it's, I have to do it every month, but right. there's not, there's no equity being, being built. Um, <clears throat> and the reality is, is, is renting just doesn't make sense if you have a possibility of buying and it, it, and it means, it means deferring things. It means making different decisions. It means yep. not taking vacations or not buying stuff. And it, it requires saving and being, and also staying out of, out of debt because consumer debt is easy to get into. Uh, and most people don't realize that mo most people's car payment can sink anywhere from a hundred to $200,000 in purchasing power. So what anybody might complain can, can, about. Can you, can you just enlarge on that? Cause I think it's sure. an interesting thing when you say that, what, what do you mean? Cause I mean, they're not buying a $200,000 car. <clears throat> right. Right. But you're, so a mortgage payment today on a hundred thousand dollars will run you roughly 550 bucks. So if you've got a seven or $800 car payment, um, you're about $150,000. Or if you go out and buy a $60,000 truck or SUV, which is fairly easy to do these days with the price <laughs> of new vehicles, uh, with, with current interest rates, you might be looking at a thousand dollar Yes. monthly payment, yep. which is about $200,000 in, in purchasing power. Uh, okay. So yes. you would be better off to go buy uh, a $1,500 beater and limp along and own your own place yes. than buy a nice car. But for a lot of people, buying a home is a someday event. Someday I'll get there, but I can buy the car I want now. <clears throat> and so it's a, it's a, an immediate gratification. It's an immediate feeling of having something nice yep. and it's way easy to get a car, uh, a, you know, car loan compared to a house, to a loan on a house. Yep. Um, Interesting. just, just even because of the process of foreclosing on a home takes a long time. There's, it's painful for the lender, whereas they can show up and put your 
car on the back of the truck and, <laughs> and they can just take it back. Whereas yep. because it's your home and rightfully so there it's, it's a more complicated process. You can't just show up back at home and your locks are changed and yes. And it's just, it, it happens overnight. You, you see it coming and it takes time. Interesting. You say like speak of both ends, the purchase end and the can't keep it. end. <laughs> right. Right. So it just, it's easy to get a car loan. It's tough to get a, to, to get right. a home loan. Um, and so, you know, people staying out of debt, people making decisions to foster the, the home buying process is it, it, it's necessary to, to get your foot in the door and to make that, to make that happen. Um, so it's, it, that I think is, is one of the reasons young people, it, it happens, it happens much later for a lot of reasons, but I do think, um, I think we're going to see, it's interesting. We have, I, I read something McLean's magazine a couple of days ago about the wealth transfer yes. that's expected over the next <laughs> You're decade, reading my mind. The next few years. Yep. And I think the number was something like 960 was the average value of a home that's fully paid off um, that would be transferred or, yes. or, or yep. maybe a state that would, that, would, that would transfer. And you figure average family, probably two kids. I don't know whether it's, you know, 1.85 or 2.5 kids yes, per yeah. family, but let's say for argument's sake, it's two and your estate is 960 and that's transferring to, to two kids. Yep. Somebody just inherits a half a million dollars. Purchasing a home becomes an entirely different ball game for right, them. Right. Um, and I think that, that for most owning their own home is clearly their best path to, to yes. creating wealth. And, and, and that's what, that would be their perception as well. Um, so, so the ability to buy changes very, very dramatically yep. over the next couple of years for a lot of, for a lot of families. Now that's going to be inherited by much, by people sort of my age and not necessarily, you know, kids. Well, but it's an interesting perspective because it's a very, like there's, there's, there's many living much longer than ever. Mm. And yet there's, there's people that are having their lives seemingly shortened and it's, it's an odd kind of thing. It's hard to be consistent about it, but in that article, I didn't read the article, but I, I saw something about, cause I'm interested in this whole demographic of the baby boom because it, I mean, they, they comparing it with populations, um, like that was a startling spike. I don't think we've ever seen it actually yeah. before since we've started to measure those things. And that has kind of, that demographic has kind of just moved through. And so they were, I, I was reading quickly that to your point, that was going to be the biggest transfer of wealth as that demographic dwindles. I'm part of that at the end. Mm -hmm. actually, so I hope it doesn't dwindle okay. too quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But, um, that was going to be the biggest transfer of wealth in his history. Yeah. And it's something like, if I remember correctly, 54% of the world's wealth is there mm. in North it's America, not world, North America. <clears throat> and the younger demographic is lower than it's almost ever been. It's something like 5%. So that's a gigantic shift mm. when you say that. And I was going to say, I don't want to be, I'm sure somebody will question the numbers they gave, but it's, oh, sure. it's not a close comparison is what my point is, right? Yeah. It's quite yeah. different. And because of it, our, our world in many ways is set up to deal with that larger population. Yeah. And when we have like the likes of like a must coming out and saying the world's population is going to decline, that's the bigger issue we should be concerned with. And uh, I'm always intrigued by how, yeah. how you see that when you're looking at it from the real estate trending perspective. Yeah. Well, I, I think over the next couple of years, we're going to see a dramatic shift in purchasing again. So we had, you know, pandemic yep. buying was spurred by, by a change in mentality about people's homes. People were focused very much on being outside their home and then all of a sudden everybody's cooped up in their home and they're looking around and thinking something needs to change. And they were all working from home. And so the, the ability to sit and, you know, 
or they're on a zoom call and you can have the camera up with the, yep. you know, surfing realtor.ca or REW or something looking at homes going, I need something with an office. I need something bigger. Um, this place is too cramped because now all of us are home. Um, it had people thinking differently, but there wasn't, you know, supply wasn't huge there, but demand was high. Uh, the last few couple of years with the slowdown that has actually further reduced supply, even though we have a lot of inventory on the market right now, the overall number of homes created isn't, it, you know, it hasn't gone up. It's, it's, it's been slowing down because of the impact of high interest rates and, and that dramatically hits, um, hits builders. And, and so a lot of, a lot of builders had to slow down their process and try to conserve capital and make sure they could keep afloat, hopefully not go bankrupt while nothing was selling. Um, because a lot of their, their timelines are pro forma is built on, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to do it in this amount of time. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and that amount of time is going to cost me this much in interest and in, Right. Carrying right. costs. And then, but we'll have, we'll have a sale and that'll produce capital and it'll all be okay. Um, whereas that the costs that they had, they could not have anticipated the cost being as high. And then because purchasing wasn't happening and the, mm -hmm. the, the number of transactions went way down. Now we're not getting, we're not recouping our, our money in our timeline. So, so that has caused projects to be deferred, like, Hey, let's not spend any more money than we need to, to keep going. We just need to, we need to finish the projects we got in the pipeline and then tread water until things start to pick up. Because if we spend more money in building, I mean, if we got a piece of land, we're already paying the interest on that. But if we can't, if we don't see a foreseeable opportunity to turn that into a sale by putting more money into bricks and mortar on the, on the, the property, all I'm doing is increasing my, my carrying costs with no with no reward so that slowed down the process of, of construction and then we're going to you know we have rate reductions i think i saw something just as we were starting to talk um you know chairman powell the fed jerome powell in the us is their press conference is starting today it's the 18th they're anticipated to reduce rates bank of canada yesterday inflation yeah what's down came out is down to two percent uh, opening the door and a little bit of buzz that mm, maybe the next rating rate reduction, which is a foregone conclusion at this point, but maybe uh, it could be a half a point instead of another quarter point. So as rates come down, uh, yesterday, Monday, another announcement came out from the federal government, Canadian federal government announced that they were extending amortization rates yes. uh, to 30 years from 25 for insured mortgages and for new builds. So um, I think it was first time home buyers and, and yes. new build construction could get 30 year uh, mortgages. So that's going to help um, people be able to afford more, but they were also um, increasing the cap on uh, what an insured mortgage can be um, from a purchase of a million dollar home uh, where it was like, literally, if it was a million and $1, you had to have 20% down. So, so consider this, we got $999,000 down and you can have, or, um, $999,000 purchase. Right. And you can do that with 75 grand down. But if it's a million and $1, it, uh, yeah. you know, $2 more, you need $200,000 down. Well, what's magic about a million dollars? Somebody arbitrarily right. said, we're going to set the threshold there. They just re increased that threshold from a million to 1.5, yes, which is going to open up people's ability to buy places that are, that maybe previously were just a bit out of their reach. Hey, if it's a million 50, I don't have enough down. We can't make this all work. Right. So that's going to put um, people back in the, the buying seat. All of these things are going to feed in, plus the transfer of wealth. I anticipate by, I, I'm not so confident that it'll be by the spring, but by the fall and definitely by 2026, we're going to see a, a pretty, uh, coming a back, pretty hot and heavy real estate market again, because the reality is the inventory is just not there holistically. Like we've got inventory on the market, but that's just because people haven't been buying as quickly as they, so as they should. Are you saying it because there's not, when you say inventory, there's not enough houses for the people that want houses. Yeah. Cause... I mean, we, you know, immigrants have, have, have joined yep. our, our country in, 
record numbers over the last couple of years. Um, I've noticed in my role that that people who come from other countries place a really high value on owning, whereas people who were maybe born here are much more content to rent. They they want the security of owning their own home, and they're willing to take the extra job, cram as many people as mm. they can in a in a home uh, to to make that happen. And so while um, while some people are are whining about the price of houses, um, others that are seeing this as a land of opportunity for them are getting busy knuckling down, rolling up their sleeves and, right. and, um, and buying. So, um, there's just not enough houses to go, to go around and that will drive prices up. It's just the law of supply and demand of it has been proven over. over well, long it's, time. it's so interesting to me when you're watching this, cause like I, I observe it all the time. Right. And it's like, when you see, like we've got an American, and, um, um, election coming up in two months. Well, it's not even two months anymore. Right. It's like, Eight weeks, six weeks, something wow. like that. November six, I think. Crazy. We we could have our own um, national election. Like I, I just saw a blurb as yeah. as we were coming on today that they're they're forming the draft for the non confidence, non -confidence vote. vote, and it very well could happen. Yeah. And uh, and like we're gonna have in BC, we're gonna have an election, and I like I I said like Next does month? anyone even know? <laughs> like, yeah. It's like, oh, well, it's, and and that's interesting. <laughs> yes, I mean I got the election notice, um, so I'm aware of that. But it was I wasn't really key. I'm like, yeah, that's coming up at some point, but didn't realize. Oh, well, huh? it's like, only a couple months away. No, it's very very close, right? And so I mean the world focus on the US election obviously, right? It's a mm -hmm. lot of crazy things going on there, but um it's it, it it does have impact on our world and uh it'll be interesting to see kind of what uh what takes place, but uh, I think it's anybody's guess actually. I just I, yeah. it, with the with the media, what things they have at their at their hands. I was talking to somebody the other day that was saying that um maybe this is the time and he was speaking really from a biblical perspective that they're going to put people in place that we need to kind of go through. Like when you go through Kings and you have all the different Kings that have been in place, some better than others, obviously. Yeah. Yep. And is this going to be a time when we, we go there? It's really interesting because we always go down the movie to shoot here a little bit, but we went to see Reagan the other day. Okay. I haven't seen it. And so this is, um, Dennis, Dennis Quaid is actually Reagan and he does a great job. Like yeah. he, he's got the voice and everything, but Reagan was kind of in place when we were in university. And the only thing I could really remember him doing a lot of, um, was the air traffic controllers and they went, they were going to go on strike. And he said, well, they're fired if they do, and we'll hire mm -hmm. new ones. And I always thought that was kind of a neat picture. Mm -hmm to like, you're going to do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it was a little part of the movie, but much more of like the nuclear um, armaments with Russia at the time. Mm -hmm. I didn't mm -hmm. realize so many Soviet secretaries in the five years he was in like the first five years of his uh, presidency, they died like five, mm -hmm. five secretaries in Russia died to go to Gorbachev. Mm -hmm. Now I wonder, do people even know who Gorbachev was? Like, it's like, that's, it's yeah. like, that's 35 years ago when the wall came down. Yeah. And there was just stuff that I just didn't realize about. Um, and I sometimes wondered, were we even paying attention? Like we like to think of when you're in university, yeah. you're paying attention, but you're still, I, I was going to say, we're, we're still very early in our world view, so to speak in yeah. the university years. So, but, um, part of the reason why we wanted to see it was because we, Dennis Quaid, we quite like, mm -hmm. but, um, I was hearing that if you posted something on Facebook, they took, we're taking it down on the movie. Interesting. So That's anyway, it was like, I, for me, it was like, it's, a, it was, it was worth, worth seeing. Um, I didn't realize how close, you know, the Cuban Missile Crisis that happened with the JFK presidency. Yeah. I didn't realize how close the Reagan presidency came to that. Interesting. Because apparently yeah. they thought that Russia had launched um, nuclear warheads at the U.S. And it was false. 
Wow. And according to the movie, they were ready to literally press the button. Wow. And apparently, um, I've talked a little bit about this. Annie Jacobson wrote a book called The Nuclear War just recently out. And uh, she's written a couple of books that I've read, Area 51, as well as um, Operation Paperclip. And I'm, I'm intrigued now to see what she would have got as an investigative reporter out of that whole story. Interesting. A any movies that she's that have been made on her books? No, I was going to say as of yet, she has not. Um, there hasn't been very any. I don't know of any movies there. Like, mm. There's a lot of things that she has written about um, that I I'm kind of fascinated by because mm -hmm, of mm -hmm. the underlying like Area 51 and. Again, this is the Cold War time, but the U.S.'s decision to do high-altitude spy photos of Russia versus trying to bomb them. Hmm. And that's where the SR-71 Blackbird was created to fly. Right. Like, at, at, and this is, whole... <clears throat> super, this is supersonic flight too, right? So <clears throat> they're, ta they're talking four and f Mach 4 and 5, uh -huh. which coincides almost with the beginning of seeing many UFOs. Okay. And like if something flew through the air above us at, I think Mach four, I'm not sure we would see it. Interesting. Like, you know how they describe the it's here and then it's instantly gone. gone. Yeah. And I sometimes wonder has some of that come from, that's why her book is so interesting because okay. she has a lot of, she does a lot of investigation. She has some really interesting, um, I was going to say, access to information. And Marie so, uh, grew up in in New Mexico, so she's been to been to Roswell and oh wow. And I mean, I think I don't know if we've driven through it. I think we drove drove through Roswell at some point, but um, that's yeah, a it's, story. It's it's a it's a fascinating. <laughs> fascinating place i mean new mexico is a bit of a magnet for you got you got the the funny bunch in, in around roswell and you've got the hippies up in santa fe and it's kind of a kind of an interesting melting pot in new and, mexico is and kind of the setting for breaking bad i think right <laughs> yeah, yeah. i forgot that was, uh, was there i didn't make it past uh well we didn't make it past i don't know episode four or something oh. breaking bad <laughs> Marie, yeah, yeah. Any any sort of stressful, stressful show like that, and it just doesn't fly with Marie, and she just yes, yeah. You, know, you want to one of all your fingernails. I can remember, like we we really quite liked it, but I can remember um, how I said it's interesting how you can write about um, and make these people that are doing pretty atrocious things. You you're 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 on their side. Mm -hmm. Like I found it like how that is such an interesting yeah. way of being able, because yeah. you've, you've kind of written that you see what's mm -hmm. kind of gone on yeah. and there is something inside you that has an empathy for why that happened. And then, and then you're amazed when you start rooting for them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's often, you know, some great characters like that, that, that make you, that make you like them in some in some way. No but, question about it. Well, so when, when we we're, we're talking about this, um, uh, we switched kind of gears there kind of quickly, but, um, how were, when you say you're seeing end of 25, early 26, you're going to see a real kind of trend change resurgence. to what's going yeah. on. What do you like? What do you see like right now? Like, what is that? Like, cause I, you hear things like, um, like office space, being very vacant around mm -hmm. different places. You hear, um, we just got recently back from Ontario. Um, and again, I'm not in it. Like I'm not in that market where I'm looking to do something. I'm only hearing mm -hmm. things. Enormous drop in condo sales in, in Toronto area. Right. And you hear musings of these and I'm, I'm just intrigued. Like what, like you hear, I'm sure like you, it's like, like, your awareness of this stuff is just, I'm sure on all the time, 24 seven, but, um, oh, and, and everybody's got different, differing opinions. You can get a bunch of realtors in, in the room and you'll hear <laughs> different people have different perspectives on the reasons why. Um, so my, you know, my perspective or my opinions just, 
just my opinion. Um, I, I think, you know, you had, you had demand that was really high for homes and the mar- it was driving the market upwards. There wasn't a lot of inventory right. and there was really high demand. Um, almost overnight, that demand stopped. It was just like somebody turned the tap off. Tap off. Now, was was uh, that due to the interest rates? Do you believe? Or well, what? yeah, yeah. I, I mean, the interest rates started climbing, and of course, it happened that ha- quick. I mean, the reality is, this is what's so funny: is people will sell one thing in the one in one direction, and then the, they'll they'll deny the opposite. Okay, <laughs> property prices will come down as interest rates go up. Okay, that's everybody was comfortable with that. So, so why buy now? Let's wait until as interest rates go up, then we'll buy at a lower price. But that didn't that happen, makes, right? That makes sense. But then people deferred because it was a questionable. Well, okay, now that interest rates are up, then maybe we're going to start to see foreclosures. So we'll wait and see if if people just start selling, which. It, in my opinion, is the most ridiculous thing ever because people will do everything they can to hold on to their home because For sure. the reality is, is you haven't lost any money until you've sold it. Right, right. And right. you have a roof over your head. So people should do everything they can to hold on to their home because it's not like, well, oh, we bought it for this and now it's worth this and it'll never go back up. Like give your head a shake. Even in 2008, when everything tanked, things rebounded relatively quickly. Right. Um, we have a hard time as a human being with temporary, right? Sure. Sure. And, and it's always so, going to be like this. <laughs> so rates are going up. Uh, so property prices are come down. So we'll wait until they they're coming down as far as they're going to come down. And then it was, well, wait, let's wait longer. I mean, the reality is, is the bottom already happened. Like the bottom, we can look back and see that the bottom of the market happened in December of 2020. Two. Yes. Okay, interesting. That was the that was absolute bottom for that cycle, and things have rebounded since then. They came back up. They leveled off. It maybe came down a tiny bit, but still considerably, you know, ten to fifteen percent higher than what it was in December of twenty twenty two. So, so it stopped, and then as prices are coming back up, nobody's buying. Or not nobody's buying. Right. Many of the people that said, hey, I'm going to wait until prices come down, didn't buy. And they missed the window of buying. Now, is there a perfect apex? I mean, in the reality, is there a perfect point at where you buy relative to interest rates going down that creates the maximum advantage of, of the balance of both in your in your pocket? I don't know what that is. But Let's face it, what you paid for your house is what you paid for your house, regardless of what the interest rates right, do in the, right. in the future. Yeah. Like you lock in that purchase price and you will be paying, if I buy it today in 2024, in today's dollars, and I spend a million bucks, I will be, and if it's 25, even if it's a 25 year amortization, I'm paying that $1 million, I'm paying that off even 24 years from now, it's still only worth it. You're still only paying off your million dollar right, debt that you bought it, but at. you're paying it off with future dollars, which we all know, even if we see 2% compounded inflation, what's 2% compounded inflation over 24 years, you're going to be paying off, paying it off with inflated dollars. Just like, you know, you, you have a house, we bought our first house for 500,000 in 07. If I was paying that off, if we still owned it today, I would still be paying it off, but five hundred thousand dollars like mm-hmm. the price of a condo yes it, it, you know what's the price of a big mac today compared to what it was uh 20 it's, years ago yeah. so the same <laughs> yeah well, no. um i can't wrap my head around the fact that you know paying know, 12 dollars or 15 dollars for mcdonald's hamburger just tilt um <laughs> but but that's i mean and, and every generation says that yeah um so buying buying when prices are low makes the most sense. And even though rate interest rates were fairly high, if you actually did the math, your payment was virtually the same. Prices went down payment because people still only have so much disposable cash. But if your if your monthly payment is the same mm-hmm. with a high priced home and low interest rates, that is with a low priced home and high interest rates which serves you better? Well, low price home and high interest rates serves you better on the long haul because 
rates will come back down. They are mm-hmm. cyclical uh, and it may be, I mean, it's been 40 years since we've seen rates raised as dramatically as they were in, in the this 80s. last, you know, in this last while. Yeah. yeah, yeah so for sure. So what's the, what's the odds we're going to see as painful an interest rate environment again, even within the lifetime of your mortgage, there's a, there's a good chance we could dodge it completely. Right. And that the interest rates will remain in around or on the long haul will average out somewhere in the, the mid to high threes, maybe low fours, three and a half to, to four and a quarter ish, because I think the neutral rate is supposed to be inflation plus one. Interesting. Interesting. So if they're get, if they're gunning for two percent inflation, then a three percent interest rate seems about ballpark. Um, banks take their margin or whatever, and it's it's in the right. mid to high threes. Wow, which is totally reasonable and and very mm-hmm. affordable. And if you bought your home for ten percent less, then you're just making hay over the over the yes, long haul. Yes, so yeah. um, I, I think a lot of people they waited. And then they waited for something else. And then in the end, it was just procrastination is right. You right. know, it's contagious. And, and especially with our media saying that things are, are, oh, and there's always something worse around the corner. For sure. And for sure. Until, until there's, until they've just predicted something so bad that there's nothing, you can't go bad worse from there. And then, then they find something else it, to hop on. It is an interesting phenomena to me is this whole, like what, were kind of propagated in we hear about and then when you look at your own life and what's kind of going on and i mean just to be in canada alone like what we have available to us and what we can get despite this like kind of over this oh oh, this looming thing that's going to happen and you kind of think well i mean we have our we have our phones, we have our cars, we have our yeah. food. It's like still pretty amazing what we kind of have. Yeah. Rarely do things turn out as as badly as what people <laughs> predict. You know, it, it, bad news, bad news. It's 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 great for the clicks. It's great for the for the yes, views. Yes. Um, but I don't think it 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 rarely ever shakes out as as bad as what as what people predict and you probably you probably find with like the the people that you deal with every deal is different right to such an extreme and to try and fit it into what the trend are saying like you're probably kind of often like your eyes are kind of like okay well, what's interesting this, is this is what's going on i mean now's a great time now's a great time to buy it's there have been better times over the last 18 months, right. but, but let's face it, you know, having a, I heard somebody say that one of the keys to, you know, to being, to succeeding in investing is having a short memory because people that, ah. people that miss the boat on some, oh, I missed the boat on Tesla right. or I missed the boat on Amazon. And you keep saying that, and yet it still keeps going up. Yes. And, and if you would just have gotten in at some point you would find, Oh, we missed the boat. I should have bought 10 years ago. Well, you can do one of two things. You can not buy today and say that again in 10 years or buy today and, and be happy you did 10 years from now. You can't change the past, but you can, you can make a different decision today. Well, I mean, it's one of those things, right? When, I mean, I, I, of the time when, Apple and Microsoft and, and Microsoft was killing Apple, right? And then Apple came out, you kind of, I mean, Microsoft, believe it or not, still doing quite well, Yeah. but um, you had Apple and, and when Apple was doing that, there was no real Amazon, like, yeah. and now like Amazon kind of comes out, right? And it's, and it's like, you're, you're kind of, you'd like to be able to go backwards mm-hmm. to understand what's coming forwards, but we can't do that. Yeah. And so what the next, what that next thing's going to be is kind of anybody's guess, I think. Sure. And I think real estate, one of the things I noticed very young, uh, I would ask people about their home purchasing experience. We were, we were working on cruise ships. I was early twenties and I would, I, I had interest in owning real estate and would ask people about, you know, you own a home, how did that go? And everybody to the person would tell a story of how they, 
they bought for way more money than anybody in their family thought that they should be spending on a home. You have no business. Your, your home shouldn't be worth more than a, you know, a year's <laughs> salary or four <laughs> year salary, whatever it was. And you're crazy. And everybody to the person looking back said, man, we're, and we're so glad we did. And it didn't right. seem to matter if you were talking to somebody who was 90 or you were talking to somebody who was in their fifties. Um, the story was always the same. And the reality is with inflation, the price of homes will go up. They're not making any more land. Um, and there's know, lots of land. There, there is lots of land, but especially in the, in the lower mainland there, you know, we have some really distinct geographical constraints right, right. where our major city is on one end and the only really reasonable direction to build out is, is East. And at hope you run into the mountains and the passes and you've got mountains to the North and border you know, U S border to the South and the water on the West, it, you know, as long as people want to live in, in the lower mainland, there's going to be demand for, for homes. And it, and, and it works both ways, right? Because that's where investment's going to go up. Like, so you've got the investors, the captains of industry, and what they're doing, but also as a person living there, your convenience of everything, right? Like, it's like, like, that's one of the things that we've yeah. noticed where we're located now, right? Like yeah. everything's so, very, very local. Yeah. And I kind of kind of, this was a concept that we'd kind of come up with year, uh, recently was like this whole idea. Most of my working life in the corporate world, I was commuting 45 minutes minimum. Yeah. So you had a job, but you had to have a car yeah. to get there. Right. And so that car was a, a cost that was associated with all of those things. Right. And it was, when you're, you can see why the city centers and the urban areas become more and more interesting because a lot of those things, like to have that job, if you don't need a car to get to your job, that changes it quite dramatically. And to your point about a house, that changes, like you've just added 200,000 to what you could purchase a house for, right? Yeah. And yeah. And it's, and I think a lot of those shifts to me, I'm finding quite fascinating because man, if you could work close to where you live, that changes a lot of stuff actually. And there's so many differing opinions about what people want. I have people that go, yes. you know, we want to get out away from the crowds. I don't want to, I, I want to not really <laughs> see my neighbors. And then, you know, lots of people are living in townhomes or condos. There's really something for kind of all, all lifestyle preferences, as far as where, you know, how you want to live, where you want to live. You can, you can work in Burnaby and live in Chilliwack and it allows you to afford a, a bigger home and a bigger yard. And if that's something that's important to you and it's worth yes. trading, trading your time on the road, so be it. Um, you know, it's, it, it really is a matter, or you can live in a town home and, and live right close to the city or even in a condo and be, you know, right in the middle of it all and not need a car and, and all those things. So it just kind of depends on what you, what you want. When, when, when you talk about that, I find it kind of interesting because I think we've talked about community earlier on. And one of the things that I think the, te the pandemic demonstrated us in a big way was the importance of that. I think we're still struggling with it and to be honest, right? There, there is a certain comfort of having your own area and being, your own stuff. Mm -hmm. But for my shift, my, my journey, like it's been like the community part has just been huge. Mm -hmm. Like it's just so such a, a different, shall we say experience to, to kind of over to see that. So like the city center now, like, yeah, it's, you, you love that idea of being out suburban and you said the bigger lot and all that kind of stuff. But there's also a pretty cool thing about being around people to me. Yeah. That you don't, you lose that. And I, I, I sometimes, well, it's funny because I was listening to John Lennox yesterday on a, uh, I think it was a podcast, but I think he was lecturing and he was talking about John, the book of John. Okay. And at the end, um, I think God comes to John and he asks, what do you want? And I, I often like, we, we go, we can go there very quickly with an answer. 
like, oh, I want a bigger house or I want a big car. I want to, and then you kind of, you, once you got it, now it's all different. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I sometimes wonder, like in your world, you see one thing and then you see after that's happened, mm. how often is it maintained or is it like, no, I got to get something next. And how does that, the community kind of make a, a part of that or does that even come into it at all <clears throat> i think i think most people are are their feelings on community are kind of built around their own just their own preferences you know right. i I have, I have had clients who in a townhome complex and people check on them because they're older right. and that for them lacks privacy they need people they need, they need to mind their own business um i i want i want some place where people aren't so nosy that's a demographic for sure too, right? Uh, but, uh, and that's, and, and that's somebody now, now are, you know, I'm not, I'm not there. I, I don't know how those conversations go or, or the, the sum of their interactions. So maybe the people are being nosy or maybe yes, they're just absolutely. caring, caring neighbors. And, but, but for those folks, it's not, you know, not super comfortable. Uh, somebody else, you know, going, Hey, we're in, we're in a condo. I hate strata. I don't, uh, you know, I, I don't, I, you know, we need to be a way where we don't have somebody else telling us what we can and can't, can't right, do. Right. Right. Yes. Yes. Um, and you know, there's some big pluses to strata, but there's also some, some big downsides for, for some people. And so it's, right. it's kind of, how are you wired? Um, right. you're wired for connection. You, you connect with people as part of your day to day life. Sometimes um, you don't you even wanna... know this. <laughs> sure. So I think some, I think it really all depends on, on how people yeah. are wired when it comes to community and having the, you know, feeling the benefit of being right. uh, in, in community. I had a, a former high school principal, actually it was my eighth grade humanities teacher that they moved. They actually sold their home near the school where he worked, moved into Vancouver, bought a condo and he commuted um, to Abbotsford to, to work, um, at a private school in Abbotsford. And so for them, he was going opposite the traffic right. and they loved city life. They were near Cole Harbor. They walked around. I mean, it sounds idyllic. Like it sounds like a really neat life. It wouldn't work for, you know, my wife has a business that, <laughs> that requires a lot of space. Yeah. Um, you know, so, so for us, we need a, need a yeah. house, but the idea of being in a tower with a view of the mountains and right downtown and cool restaurants and shops. I mean, they were, their kids were graduated out of the yeah. house uh, and it, it worked well for them. Um, some people that would just be like, shoot me now. I, they yep. would never want to live in a condo downtown. So you, you don't with, with, with um, some of the people that you deal with, you don't hear echoes from the pandemic of, of reasons for doing different things, really? I don't think so. Interesting. No. I mean, Interesting. The, the pandemic's kind of a weird thing. It's kind of oh, like, did sure. that actually, like, when did was that? that? <laughs> when was that? And it's like we just lost two years. Mm -hmm. It's like they just got erased. Like, ah, uh, okay, you know, take two. Yep. And we just started after that. Like, it didn't even happen. I know we had birth. I mean, Marie had her her fortieth birthday during the pandemic, and like <laughs> it happened. I know it happened, and I see the effects of it happening. And there's people that talk like child conceived and born during yep. the pandemic. Yep. I mean, yep. clearly the pandemic happened, but it just seems like some kind of weird bad dream that we wake up from and kind of got back on on with regular it's, life. It's interesting you say that because it's like as humans we do move on, right? Like we do, like, like we just, yeah. we don't, I don't know that we know this about ourselves, but it's yeah. like, we tend to like, we don't want change, but when change happens and often it's forced, it doesn't take very long to move on. Yeah. By or even large. to go, even to go back. I, I remember so many times people saying things like, do you think we'll ever shake hands again? Like, or do you think shaking hands will just stop being a thing or, <laughs> you know, buffets or like, you know, well, will we go back to work or will we always work from home? Ah, uh, yeah. You know, the office is, is long gone. I mean, there's lots of companies that have people going back to the office. I mean, we need connection and that's, you know, you need connection in the office 
but the reality is the office also wastes a ton of time because you are distracted and right, right. you can overconnect and then not get the things done that you need, you need to get done. Um, there's all kinds of things that, yes, there's, there's lasting changes that take, that took place because of the pandemic, but then there's also things we just kind of went and back I, to I, normal. I think there's still like, I mean, the pen after that, that's when we really started to hear this whole AI world, right? This, mm -hmm. and, um, it's interesting that like some of that came because people, people with AI, we can now work from home as an example, or there'll be less things that are kind of going on. And I'm intrigued, um, from your world, do you see anything that's going on with regards to this, this I'll call constant media push on artificial intelligence going to oh, change everything? Because it's one I mean, of those there's things. A I... There's a ton of talk in the in the real estate industry about what it'll change, and and the, the most extreme would be: do do we need realtors? You know, AI can write a contract, negotiate, you know, negotiate on our our behalf. Um, you know, uh, see, like to me, that estimate is... values on on homes, the whole bit. I, I think, it's, I think there are things that, that can, there's things that we do that don't need to take our time to be done. And I think that's one of the wonderful things about technology is right. it, it allows us to accomplish things more quickly. Uh, it'll, it will shift people into other industries. It right. will allow people to either be more productive or to have more personal time or, it, you know, there's some, there's some big pluses. Do I ever think it'll take the, the, the people out of it? No, I don't. I like, I don't think it'll take realtors out of, out of the role. It just may take some of the more mundane things that we do oh, out of the, out of the picture, which is great. Cause at the end of the day, I'm a combination between a pastor and a hostage negotiator. Like <laughs> I, you know, I, I, mean, I have to talk people uh, off down the off ledge. the ledge. People make rash emotional yes. decisions. And if you put two computers, you know, and dealing with individuals, you know, is there's nobody to just, just to calm them down and to, you know, to help them, help them see past the moment. And, you know, you, you, you need people need people. Um, no, the for sure. And to me that, that is a big part of the realtor world. Um, like, cause you, by and large, there's a huge connection that goes on as you said, like you're, 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 you're a pastor to, and, a, and a hostage neg negotiator. It's like of, of, um, of I'll say jobs that are like that. Um, it's like every one of your things is different, right? Like, yeah. Yes. You have the forms that are probably somewhat the same, Yeah. but you don't fill them out the same way with no. two, with two people. Yeah. So I find it really hard to see, that happening in a replacement. Yep. And that's why I said, like, I don't, I don't think of your role, like you're your own business, right? You're, yeah. you're not like a, uh, an office worker, so to speak. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and like, you don't write reports really, like you are trying to f match what someone wants with, yeah. and you've got so much open to you, right? Like everyone's a new ball game. I would imagine. Yeah, right? yeah absolutely. No, it's uh, it's incredibly unique. It's about understanding people, and, and not everybody works the same way. And, yes. and you know, some people just go on autopilot, and some people are very transactional. And um, you know, there's times where probably uh, it would be the better thing to get to give people uh, more of an obligation to fit into my world rather than necessarily um, being as flexible as I can be sometimes, sometimes setting expectations for people and go, okay, here's, here's what I need from you. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's, you know, a growth uh, that, that can take place on my part over, over time or, or not, I can choose to just take it as chaotically as it, as it happens. And that be, that be me. But, um, their reality is, is, yeah, there's a, there's a client for every realtor and, and it's just about trying to find your, who your people are. Right. Right. Um, as far as AI goes, it's, you know, it's interesting to like today with things like Canva, like most, most agents have a much better look branding. 
marketing because of apps like Canva and, you know, AI is helpful at suggesting everything from hashtags to, you know, how do you say this sentence a little bit better? Or, you know, sometimes writing, writing real estate descriptions can be rather mundane and you, you, you tend to write them the way you write them and they all kind of sound the, the same. Right. And so, you know, you can, you can get some ideas from AI to go, how, how many different ways can I say, you know, it's <laughs> three bed, right, four bed, right. you know, yes. you're, you're, you're saying factual things, but you're trying to make them sound fluffy. And some people are, are better that, you know, some people are better writers than others and AI helps them with that. I can see a day where AI can check contracts for duplicates and double negatives and vague statements where I, you know, put something in and go, Hey, uh, give me an extra set of eyeballs on this. What do you see is the, is the problem with this? But that would be a contract. tool. That would be a tool oh, 100%, for you to use, yeah. right? That like so, but I mean, still, it's still a, it's still AI. It's still what we call AI, yes, whether yes. it's really artificial intelligence or it's just you know looking at parameters and 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 validating something. But um, yeah, I, I think I think AI will be will will be an ever growing part of well of what we do and. It, it, it for sure. I mean, and there was a discussion the the other day I was listening to um, around uh, it becoming sentient. So in the ability to sense, like our smell, feel, and or reason, the things that make us human. Yeah. And we we jump there so quick with this technology, sure. just in most, like even robots, yeah. right? And it, and it's like we seem to forget, like we can't create water, <laughs> like. Like we can extract the uh, hydrogen and oxygen from different things, but we can't actually create even an atom. And yet we're going to jump to the conclusion that, okay, now, now we've got computers and data. We're going to go and it's going to become sentient. And I just, my, my argument was around it. It's not that it can, because I completely disagree that it will ever. Hmm. But if you believe that it is, then we've got a, tr a problem. Because mm. that means it can, it can, if you believe, it can, it can deceive you. It, well, that's yeah. the deception of the whole yeah. thing, right? And it's like, like I think of, like I mean, in many ways today, I, I just think go back to like thirty years ago and having something like Google, like you could ask it any question, and it, it will come back with information for you, right? Right. And in many ways, when we think of intelligence, I think. When we can be at like a social gathering and somebody can remember, like I often use the example, the manifest of the Titanic, and they can rhyme that off to you. We're impressed by that. Oh, you're really, really smart. And you kind of go, but you can just go to Google and find that out instantly. Sure. And that's going to become more and more available all the time. It's going to become more and more inherent to us. Well, and the interesting thing, and I don't know if this plays in, but you think about something like Google. There's lots of times I try to I try to ask a question of Google that I don't get what I'm looking for. Right, right. And I have to think of a do half a dozen different ways to ask that question to see if see if a better right. question will produce what I want. But otherwise, it's just not getting to. And and then we have, you know, as as a public or you know between marketers and and SEO specialists and stuff, we're we're always trying to game Google to get our thing, not necessarily to make sure our correct answer is found, but that our thing ranks higher. Right, right, absolutely. And oftentimes it's not the answer to the question. It's not what I'm after, but it's right. somebody's figure out a way to, to push me some, to somewhere else, some, some service or some somewhere else. So I think, you know, you're never going to take away the desire of the business community to work to game yes. the system, yep. even if it's AI related, everybody's looking for a, a, you know, for an edge or a leg up. And so people are going to be, be the variable and you'll never take, you'll, you'll never take that out. No, no um, for sure. Of, of the mix. And, you know, it's interesting that to a certain extent, technology hasn't advanced as far as what we might have thought it should have by now. There's stuff that we can do now today that, you know, 15 years ago, I was going, why can't, why can't this program do that? 
<laughs> and the short answer is because there wasn't an economic incentive for somebody to spend the hours it would, of programming it would have taken to, to, to do that. And you also just hit kind of the nail on the head to me, someone to program it. Like you still need, like even with all well, the now algorithms. You can have, now you can have stuff write the program. You can describe what you want it to do and it will write the programming to do it, which is, which is pretty cool. But somebody's created it to do that. Right. Like it didn't create itself to do that. And this is where the confusion comes right. into play, right? It's like, if you can get like that algorithm writer, that program, whatever, and you get it to, you can explain to that person what you want. There's a butter chance that you're going to get what you want. Can, can AI program AI? Like, can AI create AI? It, it, again, it, to me, in putting those things in the algorithms that the writer creates, they will be able to do those things. And mm -hmm. when you look at it as an outsider, like, it'll look like that's what it's doing, right? Yeah. And I think that this is where I think the, 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 the jam up gets, gets in place is that we believe it'll, there, there's a belief that it'll be able to go on and create it. Mm -hmm. And again, it's like, if you set the parameters up so that it can do that, it might come up with new ones too. Yeah. Yeah. But it, by, but it won't, it won't be able to be, like I said, the, the sentient part. Cause like, we just don't even, we don't even yeah. understand it ourselves. Right. Like what is <laughs> smell? Like, how do you, what's smell? Like, Yes, we've got lots of sensors that can pick up different vapors and yeah. tell you those things, but they don't come with a feeling. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and yeah, the complexity of the human, the human machine, if you will, is it's just it's vast, and I oh, and I think nice. you know anytime well, we've, I think we've talked about this before. Don't know if I made it in a in an actual podcast, but. <laughs> Uh, you know, the idea that, you know, as, as, as far out as we look, we discover there's more oh. and as small as we look, we discover there's more. Absolutely. And if you, you know, start trying to explore the ocean, there's more. And I think that the, just the infinite nature of God's creative right. ability has left us n no end to, to, you know, to discover that we're, we're able to, you know, to look and discover and to postulate. And, and at the end, all you find is the infiniteness and the magnificence of, of who God is in whatever direction, big or small. Yes. We, we look. Um, and I think it, it just kind of goes back to how small, um, even, you know, our creation around AI or it's, it's, it's abilities, I think are dwarfed by, by the vastness and the infiniteness of God. And then you take, a, and, then, and then you consider that we were made in yes. God's image. And so if God created us in, in his likeness, I don't think that the, much like the creation will never have the upper, upper hand the, the created thing will never have the upper upper hand on the creator um, in the same way that AI will never have the upper hand on yes. on us as the creators of, of well, AI. It's, it, it's interesting that you say that because it was a comment that was made that um, God only appeared through man. The only mm. animal he ever became was man. How interesting. Yeah. What so a great, what a great thought. Now I've never heard that before. I, I was kind of caught off guard with it because mm -hmm. I, I, I read a lot of some of Hugh Ross's work, which I think we've talked about before and why the universe was created as is. And he has a, like, he's an astrophysicist out of, uh, well, he's connected with UBC and university of Toronto, but, um, he has this kind of demonstration that the universe was created for us. And when I first heard that, I thought that was a ludicrous thing to even say, right? When you think of how big it is. But when you start thinking of this infinity that you mentioned, right? Mm -hmm. I think we struggle with infinity. Like, I don't yeah. think we can understand it. 
from the very big to the very small. And when, um, he, when he said, the more I look and read what he talks about, the more I think he's right. Mm -hmm. Because we haven't found life anywhere else either, right? <laughs> right. This is the stunning yep. part to me. Yeah. Is like back in the 60s. And again, that's such recent history, right? But with SETI and Carl Sagan and yeah. his whole concept, well, you needed a star and you needed a planet this distance from a star and then you could create life. Well, that was two things. So with two things, there's it's got to be happened somewhere else in the universe. Right. And that list now has grown to like over 200 different parameters, which is like, it's more probable that we don't actually exist than we do. Which, right. is, which is the staggering statement itself. So when I yeah. hear that, I think when he said that statement about God only appeared, the only appeared as a human being, that starts to link that to me, yeah, to that whole concept. It's interesting um, to imagine what would life look like if we stopped spending so much energy trying to... Um, basically work for answers outside of God. But if we were to actually work with, I mean, if, if, if we had established firmly that there is a creator, we have a, a, um, yes. a, ben, a, a, a benevolent, a, like a, 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 a loving creator uh, that wants to have relationship and communicate with us if we could as a global society embrace that understanding and work from that, from that as our foundation, what could, and then, be? and, and then create, yeah, it would be, well, it would be an entirely uh, different story. I sometimes like to think that this is why I, I, I find AI fascinating is because we've spent, like, I think of schooling, we spent so many years getting curriculums together, right? which is basically the how part, like you're learning math and you're learning geography and you're, and, and there'd be the odd kid that I was like, why am I learning calculus? I'm never going to look calculus. So, and it's hard sure. to learn. Right. And I used to kind of like be very much like, that's kind of how I was raised in a way. That's what you're, what you're getting and not the social aspect of it. And now I'm starting to think that it's reverse. Hmm. The social aspect is actually the more important part of it because AI is going to bring the curriculum part to us, whether sure. we like it or not. Right. So when you're thinking of the social aspect of it is like come out of the school, what are you going to do with your life? Yeah. Like, not that I can, I know mathematics and geography and all this stuff, but what is it that cranks you up? Like, what is it that mm. you think your purpose is? How does that fit together in discovering that? And to me, I think a big part of that comes from the connected, the community, the social aspect yeah. of it, right? Yeah, I I heard somebody, um, and I'll Jamie Winship because I was mm -hmm. bring him up on every yes. every podcast. But Jamie Winship talks about identity being formed in community. Yes, um, and really from identity, you identity is what you carry with you, no matter what you're doing. If, if you can be your identity, whether you're in a classroom or whether mm -hmm. you're in, on a job or on a battlefield or in a hospital room, who you are is who you are and what, you know, your, your identity is what you bring, bring to the table. So I think, yeah, a lot of, a lot of those things we are forming identity and sometimes they're false identities, you know, right, right. right. Sometimes a school <laughs> experience can be really negative for somebody and lots of, lots of negative things spoken that we begin to believe about ourselves. that, you know, that then it impacts, uh, you know, we start operating in a false identity, but, right. um, but yeah, identity is formed in community. I agree with you. There. And, and it's, and it's interesting that like when you put it into those words, it gets kind of confusing because, <clears throat> you don't necessarily know that's what you are, right? Like it's mm. just trying to figure out like, how is that my, like, how is that my identity? Like um, you were, we're, cause we like to categorize, right? Like we like mm -hmm. to put names on things and what they are. Right. And often we don't know what they even are, but that's how we feel or act or do. 
Mm -hmm. And that's why I said I'm, I'm fascinated by this because I think as we see the technology grow, um, it's going to become more and more like, especially because we're going to carry it with us like all the time. Right. And the schooling part is, a is, is a challenge to me because how do you, how do you kind of speak to every child? Cause every yeah. one of them, it's, it's kind of like as a real estate person, you have a, a, a well, we call them a client, but it's a person that's coming to you to help me get a house. And today you pretty much have to do that, right? Like mm -hmm. it's, you're not going to get a house without doing that. And you don't kind of group them all up in one classroom. Right. Yep. <laughs> you individually work with them, right. To figure out. <clears throat> and I think this is what makes you good at what you do is you understand that. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and I sometimes wonder we really miss that in the schooling system. And I think it's becoming more because it's almost impossible, right? Like how do you match a, a teacher with a single student all the time? Totally. But will AI help us to be able to enable some of those things to better happen? Because we won't be so caught up in things like curriculum. Interesting. I don't know. I mean, I, I think ultimately you have to, you have to consider the people that you're teaching, leading, training, that requires attention. Mm -hmm. um, and, and for a lot of people, it's, <laughs> it's not necessarily what they're right, what their gifting is to necessarily stop and, and think about the individual and especially with categories and groups and, and some of the different gang names that we give people in different categories and whether they're conditions or even age categories, we tend to lump and group and categorize. Oh yes. And more it than all ever. Just, it all distracts. Yes. And, and, and society has lent itself, has, has gone down the route of, of trying to solve that problem with a better label. So, yeah. so now we just need to get better with our labels or change our label or our, our label is wrong our labels wrong. So we need a different label and that's where I will be seen, seen and understood and heard. And, and my and, identity will be, yeah, will it, be more clear, but it's, it's a, <laughs> it's a pot of gold at the end of a rainbow that we're chasing because you just can't, you can't get to the, to that point because what it does is it keeps you from actually considering the individual. The reality is, is you're a, you're a group or you're a label of one. Yes. And that's, and, and that's really, and even we, ch we try to change our name. Oh, uh, you know, if, if I have a different name that yep. that will, I'll, I'll be better seen and her, you know, who I am will be better known. And, and it's just, it's a, it's a, a pursuit that doesn't lead anywhere. Yes. Um, because you are you, and I think the, you're a group of, of one and anything, if we, if we categorize you any more than that, we are going to be squeezing you into something that doesn't leave space for something really to be known or considered. We still have to consider you because something will be left out. Yes. And I was talking with somebody not too long ago. And we were talking about, um, we were talking about somebody that they knew somebody in their family. And they mentioned this person having ADHD or I think it was ADHD. Um, and it was an older person. And so it, what, what I thought was interesting is like, when you say that now I start to draw conclusions about that person. Absolutely. It, and what I think that means or what I, I start to stop considering their uniqueness and I now consider that category. Yeah, for sure you do. And, you know, I won't use their, their name, but you know, let's, let's call them Bob, right. you know, it, without that statement, oh, they have ADHD or it's their ADHD. If you had said, oh, you know, you know how Bob is. And they'd be like, oh yeah, Bob's Bob. Yeah. Bob's Bob. Like, right. Oh yeah. Totally. Bob's Bob. And without, without that label, when you say, oh yeah, you like, you think about them. You don't think about a category. You don't think of anybody else with that label. You just think of their uniqueness. I mean, I'm a weird cat too. Like I've got 
quirks and coming out my ears. But to give me a label doesn't do me justice. Like you can, you can talk about all the weird yes. and wonderful aspects of my personality. Yes. But if you talk about them in terms of just me, you will be far more accurate and have a far better understanding of who I am than if you give me a label. Cause the second oh, we sure. start throwing some labels at it, now you don't consider me, you consider the, what you know and understand of the label and other people are forming in informing that label because now you meet two people with that label. Now you have to cast a wide enough net yes. that label suits both people. So we're going to have to adjust that label because otherwise Bob is the very definition of that label. But the second there's Bob and there's Joe, now that label needs to fit both parties and we have to kind of homogenize it in some, in some way. So this labeling thing is like, we just need to add another letter on the alphabet soup of a group and whatever we change the change the label. And I think we are, we're painting ourselves into a corner. Um, yes. but the reality is the only label that we can give you is, you. is Doug and Jesse. And it's this specific Jesse. It's, you know, it's Jesse Earl McLeod Bragg, not, you know, not any other Jesse. Well, it's, with, when you say that, like, it's like, okay, now all the Dougs are the same. Mm -hmm. Or all the Jessies are the same. And it's kind of going like, you, 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 you don't have enough labels to describe everybody. No. Like, so now I have to know you. Yes. And I actually have to get to know you and I have to consider you. Um, and I think people seek to find identity in a label to some extent because they don't really know what their identity is other than that. So it's, it's a, it's a way of, I want to be known this way because I, I feel like, or, or maybe sometimes it's idyllic. It's like, I want to be considered the kind of person right. who, you know, my, what's, <laughs> what's my favorite color. I, this is, this is a, this is a very, you know, if somebody asked me what my favorite color is, well, you know, there's, there's the real answer. And then there's, there's the official answer. And the official answer is pink. My favorite color is pink. It's not really true, but I want to be the kind of person who's represented who's, by who, who likes, likes you know, whose favorite color is the color pink. Like I, I, that says something about me that I want thought of me, but the reality is, is almost every piece of clothing I have is blue and I buy <laughs> blue things and, and I like blue and blue is probably my favorite color. Blue is definitely my favorite color, but the official answer is pink because I like what that says about me, but <laughs> You know, so we're looking for ways to yes. influence how others consider us, whether it's a brand. I wear this brand because it's yes. not too fussy, but it's kind of fussy and it's unique. You don't see a lot, whatever, whatever the things are. And they help us try to communicate something that we want to communicate. And the reality is, is the color pink being my favorite color. What do I want it to, I'm somebody who's comfortable with my own masculinity. I'm comfortable. Oh, yeah. A million different uh, things. I'm, I'm, there's, there's things that I wanted to say and I'm trying to, I'm trying to use that to communicate something that maybe you might take you some time to get to know about me otherwise. And, and you know, what's interesting to me is in doing that, we forget that it's just in our minds. Hmm. Like it's just, we're not necessarily being to told that from anyone. It's just what we're taking in. Right. It helps how, us define that. And now we want you to represent you. We want you to see me like this. Yeah. And but sometimes it's, it's not, it's not, it's not actually you. No, it's what we want people to think of me. It's like, yes. I want you to think better of me than maybe I think of myself. I mean, I'm not, I that this is not a commentary on any particular label or group right, or right, whatever, yes. but, yeah. but just sometimes it's there. It's, I, it's idyllic. It's, it's, I want to sure be, I used to be, you know, what's, what's some, what's something. Oh, there's a question. Like you get to school, tell, you know, what's something that nobody knows about you? Yes. Yes. And yes. I would say I'm, I'm secretly six foot one. <laughs> Um, because that's, I, I want to be tall. Like, oh, there you go. Yeah, there I, I want to be a, I want to be six one. So if I can just get you to think of me as six foot one, that I, I, 
you know, and, it, and it's, it's silly because it's a physical thing that we can all, you know, factually say is not true, but I mean, not that you can see from me sitting right, here, right. but, yeah, but. Um, I'm not six one. Um, <laughs> but, but, but sometimes it's things that you, people can't validate and we still want them to think and know because it says something that we like that, that, that tugs on, on and, our internal aspirations or, or desires. And maybe they'll like me better yeah. or maybe they'll love me. And that's sometimes when sure. I wonder whether, is this all what it's really about is just a reach out? Like just, I think so. I think ultimately at the core of all of this, uh, what is it? Somebody, how oh, it's Jamie Winship. Another, you yes. know, again, I'm throwing it. I'm, I'm going to keep saying his name because then people will look him up. <laughs> there, um, good. Uh, Shout out to joy, Jamie, Jamie Winship. Winship. Joyful attachment, I think is what he calls it. Joyful. I'm looking over at my wife who's <laughs> sitting not too far away. Um, he calls it like the most, the most meaningful thing that we're all after at our very core is, is joyful attachment to others. I think that's the way he describes it, but, but, but yes, I, I think it's to be, it's to be loved. And I think we are looking for others to love us in some, in, 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 I would say in a, in broad sense, people are looking to others to love them so that they will love themselves. Um, in a lot of cases, um, because I think if you are loved, and you know your love. You love you know you're you are confident, and this is where I think the ultimate source of that being loved comes from from God. Right, right. That we receive love from God, and therefore now we are not dependent on any other source of our love in quite the same way. We, we we are full and complete in our own being loved, and now from that point we can love yes. others and operate in this life less encumbered. Um, but, but yes, I think you're, I think at your, at its core, I think you're right. I think it's a, it's a, it's a desire to be loved and we pursue those ways of being known, um, to ultimately fulfill that desire yes. for love. <laughs> and, and for those of us who have a, um, have a relationship with the creator, um, we have an obligate or an obligation. We have an opportunity to seek a, a greater, and you know, when, where we, when we're able to recognize, or if we're able to recognize that we're still kind of seeking more of that sense of being loved, right. we, we have an opportunity to actually turn our attention to God, to satisfy that. Um, to be complete in that, in that way. Right. Um, so that then we are not, we can enjoy and receive love from others, but we, it's all an, and it's all above and beyond our complete internal right. fulfillment. And so therefore we have a source to go back to. So if we find ourselves really seeking or wanting somebody to fulfill that need and, in us, we have the ability to come to, to kind of come to our senses and go, I'm, I'm clearly have not really fully fulfilled this in my relationship with God and to go back to God as a, as a source, um, for that, that fulfillment first and first and foremost, cause I think that's when we are at our, our most healthy and our mm -hmm. most, our, our most capable to, to give is out of that other, uh, that, that overflow. And if we look at scripture, how do we know how, you know, you don't need other people to love you to love them. And we know that's You're possible right, because right. God, God showed us yep. if we're made in God's image and God set us that example of loving us before we knew or loved him, um, we can follow in that same. And therefore we can also do that. We can be fulfilled and complete in ourselves. And then out of that give love yes. where even love is not returned or extended. Well, I sometimes think, because what you've articulated here to me is, is really, really, I'll say accurate, but, but felt. And I, I sometimes wonder whether when we can't see God, 
so like we have a, an entire tomb as in the old and new testament that's constantly telling us to have faith in what you can't see mm. but we have a world that's all about seeing mm. and so when we say that god loves us and we can't see him and we have so much around us that's telling us, but what we see is real. Mm -hmm. To me, that is where it gets to be very confusing for people. And then we completely forget that we had nothing to do with coming into the world. So he created us. Like, I don't know how you don't get to that yeah. conclusion that something yeah. bigger than us created us to fit into all of this. Yeah, And that's to me where if you can get to that belief sense and it's co a core deep belief that you've got to almost ignore in many ways, what's around you mm -hmm. because you can see it that if you can get to that sense. And that's why I said about why belief to me is so important. Yeah. If we believe that AI can become sentient, that's the, that's, that's the problem. The, that's the danger. Mm -hmm. And yeah. to me, why wouldn't we be then believe that we were created by something much beyond what we are and what yeah. a beautiful thing what that is and what a, an endless fascination that it is mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. mystery like and and we, and we had we had nothing to do with it right like yeah. we had nothing to do it and we're constantly faced with it like just the glass of water i drink right that i can't live without and yeah, I have that new vet in the driveway, but I can't actually create this water. Like no yeah, one can. Yeah. It's amazing yeah. to me that, that that juxtaposition that we'll believe one, but we won't believe to me that one that's just daily becomes more obvious. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. Uh, you know, I heard something said recently and I think it applies a little bit to, you know, what we've been talking about, about identity. Um, I heard somebody kind of explain, okay, science can tell us, can answer questions like how and, and, and what, um, but it doesn't, it doesn't really, it, it can't answer the questions of who and why. No. And, you know, we can look at a, we can look at a cake and we can, you know, yes. science can tell us what it's made from perhaps when it was made, um, you know, lots of details about the what and yep. even how. Yep. But if you just are presented with a cake, you can't say who made nope. that cake. And you can't say why they made that cake. And when it comes to identity, you know, only only the creator, only God is, is the creator of, of all life and really as, as uh, you know, us, the Bible to, you know, talks about God knitting us in our mother's womb. Um, God can, is the, is the only one that can really tell us why he made us uniquely us. Right. And so that, you know, that identity really comes, oh. we say identity is formed in community, but, but really the source of identity comes from what does, what does God say who yes. we are yeah. and can give us that, that encapsulated identity that defies all the labels and that can't be grouped and categorized. And it is, a, it is in a group of one and it's yes. uniquely us. Well, when you mention science to me, I find it difficult today that if you truly believe in science, I don't know how you can't believe in God. Like that's the part that I struggle with a lot, primarily because science has given us the big bang. Right? Like that's, that's what sure. science has demonstrated. So that Simons has demonstrated that there was a beginning. Yeah. And we have in the beginning. Yeah. Genesis 1.1. 1. 1. Yeah. So like yeah. to me, and I think when that came about, I think in early sixties, many, much of the science community didn't like that very much mm -hmm. because that now said we do a have a beginning, right? That we've said, no, we, we, and that's to me why I think sure. when you bring out the science, when you said the science word, I think it's so cool when you said who and why, because it's I, so true. I think it just requires people to be, to be honest about, 
maybe aversions to mm. the concept of a creator because there's implications to that and it becomes okay if i if i agree with this then what and i think it takes it takes mm. risk mm. Um, it, it requires people to take risk of going, okay, I'm going to acknowledge the, I'm going to acknowledge the obvious of a creator without necessarily having a firm grasp around what the implications are. If I say, if, if, if I'm able to acknowledge from my own ears yes. that I think there is a God and that God created the universe as we know it, I'm comfortable doing so without really having an answer or firm grasp on, okay, if that's true, then what? Um, and the answer is, I mean, yeah, I, though I can say I have, I have opinions on or, or firm understanding of, okay, the, the, then what, or, you know, the other implications, regardless of that, okay, are we willing to go, are we willing to take the first step and go, okay, yes, uh, everything, everything blatantly points to. Uh, intelligent design and a creator yeah. and now i will seek about getting and that now i will make my next step about getting to know who that is and what my role is as it relates to that but that benevolent yes. creator um or you know intelligent design intelligent creator um and so so have the have the guts to to acknowledge what's blatantly obvious, even if you don't understand the implications. Well, I, I'm in the reverse. I don't have the guts to not do that now. Yeah, interesting. Like yeah. to me, I just think you're like you're kind of like not what necessarily are there? thinking that, that that's all there. Like yeah. we said, you spoke earlier on about the the creation. You just look like at a flower, and you just see like we had nothing to do with oh, sure. what was and how many flowers are there and you can do that with so many things it's just yeah. staggering and we can't create it we could we can make art to look like it yeah but we can't do what that living thing did yeah and i just i mean that's science 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 right it just keeps doing it all the time it's it's fascinating to me and how we how it how it it breeds itself. So I, I was kind of like to go back to what you said earlier about if it could just come as a global community mm. to accept the mm. almighty, I think is what yeah. you said, right? Something to that effect. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, it, it, it's, 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 it seems like that's not in us. <laughs> and, and it's, 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 it's like, is it because we don't, if we, we don't do what we we say we're going to do. So here's an interesting one that came up yesterday. This is right out of like, this is Paul. I think this is also out of John, but Paul talks about it a lot. So we have all our laws that tell us when we're bad, that tells us when we are sinners, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's the, we're all sinners, but it doesn't tell us how not to. It doesn't prevent it. It exposes mm. it, but it doesn't right. prevent it. There's yeah. only one that died for us for our sins. Mm -hmm. And to me, when you like, those are such fundamental, like logic. I don't even know how else to say it. There's a mystery associated with it for sure. Yeah. But I think it's uh, very, to me, interesting how you said that, but how you came to what you said about like, if we could just all agree <laughs> and what we could do if we did. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. If we were Crazy. engaged in that. Yeah, totally. It's, uh, <laughs> there's, there's nowhere to, there's nowhere but up to go from, from there. So if I go back to your world of realty, mm -hmm. <laughs> not reality, but yeah, realty, but it's reality for yeah. you. How do you see this fit in with that real estate world? Like how, what we're, what we're, what we're doing, like, and, and, creating like as you said um god wants us to have a home mm. um and yeah i think you quoted scripture about that mm -hmm. and how does that fit in for you when you're kind of dealing with that on a because you you would be i think you would be you would have to deal with this quite regularly this in being the the god part of it and the mm. 
home part of it versus the investment and the dollar part of it, like having the procrastinate. I don't want to do it now because I'm not going to make enough money as an example, right? Yeah. And the home, which is our heart and coming together with that when, when you're faced with that, with, with, uh, I'll say different people that you come in contact with, not even necessarily, I, I won't even say necessarily people buying a house, but just mm -hmm. when you're, I go back to what you said to me about when you think about real estate, what do you think about? Mm -hmm. And I said money. And you were surprised by my response. I don't know that you were surprised, but you were no, just like, no, no, no. I, well, I was looking for, I, I, was, I was looking for the answer lazy. Cause I think that's, that's the other that, common that thing that people say about, about realtors. But, um, and I think you're not wrong in, in your, your thought process. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of what I'm doing is just looking to serve people where they're at. Um, you know, I don't, there's not always opportunities for me to maybe have an influence on their perspective from a, a spiritual right. um, no. creator type type focus. Um, that wasn't but, really, that wasn't really what I, I was meaning by the question. I'm, I'm, I'm more of like yourself. How do you deal with, with that in the sense I'll give you an example. I, I was hurrying about the, uh, um, uh, the other day, a lawyer was telling me a story about how he, cause I think the lawyer world is all based on money, right? Like you're doing well because of how you, what you bring in. And, and the comment was made around helping a person to win their case. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of, um, between, within a family and like a son and a father and, it was because funds weren't distributed properly or something to that effect. And when they finished and he, and, and the son was awarded stuff, he disliked or hated his father even more. Mm -hmm. And he said, and I could do nothing from a humanity perspective to help him. Right. That's well, kind of the, that's and, what I'm kind of thinking and, that. And I don't know that that's necessarily a true statement. I mean, you can speak into some of those things when you're talking to somebody say, Hey, look, you know, you can have some influence to say, you know, we can get you all the money in the world, but it forgiveness is the only thing that's going to repair this, yes, this yes. relationship. And now some people don't feel that they have the ability because, you know, that somebody could complain for me saying that, um, I, I have no idea what the, you know, the implications are for your, you know, your, your role at the, you know, your acceptance at the bar or whatever, to be able to, to right, speak right. to, to more personal matters. But, you know, if you've built a relationship with a client in such a way that you have some ability to talk, you know, talk more directly to, to their life, you know, you might have the opportunity to, to give that that mm -hmm. thought, that thought process. And, and I think I endeavored it to, tr to try to leave room for those, those conversations, okay. Um, okay. whether it be, uh, you know, having the opportunity to pray for somebody around even, uh, Oh, I remember this one yeah. time. So I'm dealing with this client and we're writing an offer and this is when things are going, they're just, they're going crazy. And, they are at like things are moving and they're going to move to the point where it's beyond their reach. Oh, and they're okay. trying to go into a town home. They were renting. They were wanting to go to a town home and they had a pit bull. And so most town homes have a dangerous breed, a regulation. Okay. So would not, I mean, this, this sweetest pit bull, just, you know, sweet old yep. dog. Yeah. Um, but most, most, uh, stratas will adjust their bylaws as they, they get up and running to exclude dangerous breeds. Right. They find a new build and prices are getting regularly adjusted and, um, like increased over time so that, uh, as the market moves, the, the price of this, them selling out this, this development. Anyway, long story short, we needed something from 
we, we found the home. It was going to fit their budget. It's by the skin of their teeth. And we needed, we write, we write an offer, they're financing things. Something happened. We had, we had to go back and we needed an extension. And I called the agent and he said, we've been burned recently. Prices are going up. The prices are now higher on the home that you already have the offer on. So if they don't, if you don't get this, they get to actually sell it at a higher price. We needed an extension because we just couldn't nail down their financing in time to remove our subjects. And then the guy just said, no way. And, uh, the, bu- like, the one who was buying with the dog was saying no way or no, the, 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 the seller, okay. this, the, 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 the developer, cause it was the, okay. the developer's agent. Ah, okay. Um, and this is just business for them, but he told me, no, no, they, they said absolutely no extensions. And so I called the, I, you know, I, I was kind of processing, okay, this is what they said. And I'm, I was getting ready to leave the house and, and I just had this, I had this picture in my mind or like this, this, this thought of calling him and praying with him. I'm like, this is, this guy's not a, not a Christian right. to the best of my knowledge. We've never just... talked about God or Jesus or anything the like. But I get in the car and I'm and I call him and I said, "Look, I said this is going to sound a little a, a, crazy, a little weird, <laughs> but um, do you mind if I pray? Um, you know, here's the situation. It looks like there's we don't have a shot, but can I pray? Yes. Okay, so I prayed. Cool. And about a half an hour later, I get a call from the guy and he said, they. I, he said, can you give me some information about the family? Cause I, she was, you know, on Matt Lee, but she was a postal worker. He worked in the fire department. You know, I'm like, they're a wonderful family. Here's the deal. And I wrote a little letter about them and about it, you know, a couple hours later, he calls me, he said, they, they, they'll give you the extension. And we got the extension, everything came together and they bought and, you know, yeah, prices so cool. prices would have gotten away from them and they would have been a no go for a town home and they couldn't buy anything older and pre built because of the dog and and so it, you know it all came together but that was a scenario where you know I've had the opportunity to kind of bring who I am into the yes in, into the mix I've had other clients that you know somebody's super stressed out about trying to deal with an offer we was again multiple offers how do I decide what to go and I say hey you mind if I pray? And, you know, I, I don't always get to do that. And I wish I did it more. Right. Um, but there's opportunities for me to, to bring who I am and what I, you know, what I think God's heart is for people, whether they, whether they know him or not, um, whether they have a direct relationship with them or not. I, I believe that God cares and, and cares about them deeply and, and loves them immensely. And, and does care about their circumstances, whether they ever acknowledge who he, who he is or, right. or not. And so I have opportunities to kind of bring, bring God into the scenario in a more known way, right. Right. a more out, out front way. And, and it's kind of, and I actually have to work hard to make sure that I, I present who I am as a believer so that I make that process as I leave the door as wide open for me to bring back into the conversation, my relationship with God with a client, because I think if I'm hamstrung and I feel like I've never talked about God before, and now I'm trying to like it, it comes up in an abrupt fashion. Right. It makes it much harder to introduce. Whereas if they know I'm a Christian, I'm a, I'm a church guy. I'm one of the elders in our church. I, you know, this is, this is, you know, really this me. It's not just, you know, yeah. whatever, uh, you know, I, I was confirmed as a child in the Catholic church or something. And I, you know, it's, <laughs> yeah. you know, I'm a Christian cause my parents were Catholic. Um, then it makes, it leaves the door open for me to have, to have those conversations and to invite God in to the scenario in an, in an open way and for them to, um, encounter God yeah. through, through our relationship and hopefully that leaves the door open. I mean, I'm looking forward to the day and I heard another realtor talk about a, a similar, I'm looking for the day when somebody calls me and says, Hey, will you pray? Here's my circumstance. They know I'm, you know, right. like, I don't know what to do. 
this seems like, you know, all else has failed. So let's let, you know, let, let, do I know somebody who knows God and well, let's call Jesse, but I actually had a, another realtor tell a story um, where I think a gentleman's wife committed suicide or, or vice versa. It was the wife yeah. and his husband's committed suicide and they didn't know who to call. And they called, they called him. Um, he was a realtor, um, but an, a very open believer and, and was able to, um, to minister to them wow. in that, in that season. So that, that to me is the ultimate, um, in my, in my role as being somebody that people turn to in a pastoral sense, because, because I've built that trust and that, that history with them. And well, so it's genuine. Yeah. Like absolutely. it's real. Like it's, yeah. uh, it's very cool. You know, I love that story. Like I, th I think that's where we should wrap today because awesome. I, I, uh, I think that's a, a wonderful way. I mean, you can hear, I mean, if you're looking to, uh, move to, do something in the real estate market. You're within the, uh, I'll call it the Fraser Valley area of British Columbia. You know who to call. You do Jesse know who to call. Break. I'd be happy. I would love to help you. Cause, and he will. And you'll find, as you've heard throughout this podcast, you'll find something that I think it's not, you don't always hear in people. We'd like to hear it more often. And, uh, He'll make you feel good for sure. Well, and hopefully and, and yeah, <laughs> other agents, you know, if other agents listen to this podcast, maybe they get a glimpse of what life, what, you know, maybe what they could be because they didn't really think it was possible. You know, they thought everybody fire them or they wouldn't get any clients if they were, if they were open about their faith and brought that into their, into it's real. their day to day. But no, anyway, it's very real. awesome. With Thanks that, for having me, Doug. Thanks for joining us today on Better Than Not. I hope you enjoyed uh, Jesse Bragg and his insight into uh, this real estate world. And I uh, hope you'll tune in next time to another episode of Better Than Not. Thanks again. Jesse, stay on for a minute and uh, bye I for will. now. Are we on? Good. Welcome to the Better Than Not podcast. Sometimes we get it right, sometimes we don't. But when we at least do something, we know it's almost always better than not. <laughs>